Islamic militants massacred at least 235 people today in Egypt when they detonated a bomb inside a crowded mosque and brazenly shot at panicked worshipers as they fled the scene. ISIS is the chief suspect for the carnage. President Trump reacted strongly on Twitter, writing in part, quote, we have to get tougher and smarter than ever before, and we will. Need the wall, need the ban. God bless the people of Egypt. As you might imagine, that did not sit well with Democrats. I'm disappointed that the president of the United States could not behave like a commander in chief and a president that would offer the president of Egypt and the people of Egypt, which I want to do right now, my deepest sympathy and prayers for them. It is absurd uh, and, and really uh, embarrassing. Uh, as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, we know this all the time. We're in classified uh, meetings about this, but it is embarrassing not to acknowledge the pain of a particular nation. The president acknowledged exactly that in his tweet when he said, quote, God bless the people of Egypt. Joining us now for analysis from Washington is Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, a former intelligence operative and a vice president at the London Center for Policy Research. And with me here in New York, Buck Sexton, a radio talk show host and a former CIA analyst. So let's just start off the top. <laughs> Tony, uh, yeah. Sheila Jackson Lee. I mean, come on. This is, you know, she always makes fun of Republicans right. when Republicans say my thoughts and prayers or with victims of gun violence. Now there's terror violence, and right. she's offering thoughts and prayers. I don't get it. Where were they two years ago when they cut off the weapons uh, the Egyptians needed to go kill these folks? I mean, that was a complete lack of sympathy. Uh, look, we, the things we're seeing right now, Jesse, are a result of the complete failure of leadership by the Obama White House and by the Obama Congress. Um, you know, they were screaming for uh, assistance. President Obama himself cut off uh, what we used to have this, uh, this uh, exercise we just started again this year called uh, Bright Star, where we exercise and help train the Egyptians. Where, where, were, where were the Democrats when Obama cut all of that off? Uh, they were nowhere to be found. So I think it's uh, not only lun lunacy that she's saying this, it's disrespectful to the president who was actually trying to do everything he can to fix the situation. And, and as every, every the time they do this, they're grandstanding and will accomplish absolutely nothing except get in the way of progress. That's true. Um, so let's just talk about the attack itself, Buck. These are, we assume, ISIS militants at this point, and they're going after Muslims praying in a mosque in Egypt. What's going on? It seems to be a complete civil war situation within Islam. So there's a very active affiliate of the Islamic State in the Sinai. There are a bunch of affiliates around the world that are also going to become, I think, more active with terrorist attacks, engage in more mass casualty events like this because of the losses that the Islamic State has suffered in Iraq and Syria. There's a sense that what was so uh, powerful about the Islamic State before, it was winning and therefore the propaganda that it was pushing around, those, it was winning in Iraq, it was winning in Syria, that was what they were telling people. Now they've lost Raqqa, now they're on the defensive. And so you have these other entities, other groups like this affiliate in Sinai that is trying to pick up the terrorist slack, if you will, and have a more prominent role on the world stage. Now, why would they target Sufis? Sufis are a mystical sect of Islam. They are considered by hardliners. And this is actually a debate that's happened inside jihadist circles between al-Qaeda and ISIS and the Islamic State, which is, can you target Muslims <clears throat> who aren't the kind of Muslim you want? Uh, are they takfir? That's the word that they use for them. And Sufis are mystics. They are considered to be actually polytheists by some of these jihadist hardliners. So they attack them to show their purity and to show that the Egyptian people can't, I mean, the Egyptian government can't actually protect its own people. And so the Egyptian government, uh, known, notorious for uh, treating their enemies the way they treat their enemies. I mean, I can't even imagine, Tony, what the Egyptian military is going to do to anybody they think is responsible for this. What do you predict to be the repercussions after something this heinous? Well, look, uh, I've met with their chief intelligence officer, uh, and look, they have, they're at a war. This is a war. You do things which are military, militarily necessary to win that war. And I think uh, they're going to go into this with uh, clear eyes. Yeah. And I think go it's going to be a little tougher than waterboarding. Let's I just, think I, just, let's just put a it little that bit. way. And, and rightfully so. I mean, look, yeah. as, as, as Buck just pointed out, 
these people are killing anybody to include their, their fellow uh, members of the Islamic faith simply because they don't have this very severe belief that they need to kill people to make their point. So, and the Egyptians have to kill them back. And we have to understand, uh, Jesse, that you need to fight to win. The Egyptians are going to have to do that, and it's going to be bloody. So the president comes out and tweets, we need the wall and we need the travel ban. And I thought it was savvy to link the wall on the southern border with Mexico to national security, because he's saying it's not just about preventing illegal aliens from crossing over the border. It's about preventing the possibility of Muslim radicals crossing the border. And I think that's a pretty effective argument. Well, as you look at what phase the Islamic State's in now, there are two major concerns. I just spoke to you about the affiliates. That's obviously a huge problem. We just saw that in the Sinai. Then there's also the problem of returnees, of the former foreign fighters who had joined the Islamic State were going to try to infiltrate. They've already done this in Europe. We've seen mass casualty attacks in Europe because of this. We know they also want to do this in the United States. And if they didn't want to do it, we'd have to ask the question why it would be so effective for them to get trained operatives into the U.S. for a mass casualty attack. And so when the president's tweeting this out, he's saying, look, ISIS is still very active. We still are in a world where jihadists are trying to kill as many people as possible. We need to do everything that we can. He's not drawing a straight line between a wall and what happened to Sinai. He's drawing a line between the threat of the Islamic State and doing everything he can do as commander in chief to make sure that we are safe here at home. Yeah, people are making fun of the president. They say, oh, what do you want to build a wall around Egypt? What, what, what is that supposed to be? Um, I just don't think they can even follow him on Twitter. And by the way, he tweeted this about the Egypt attack while he was golfing with Tiger Woods. So he literally has the world at his fingertips, Tony. I'll give you the last he literally word. Could, he could literally do, you know, multiple tasks at the same time. Imagine that. The hmm. last guy apparently couldn't. And to that point, look, as Buck was saying, we have to be aware that it's not just Mexican drug cartels who can figure out the way to get illicit goods and people across the border. The bad guys will, too. And uh, the, uh, the ISIS folks have had aspirations of doing things here. We do know they plant people in both the refugee pipeline as well as any sort of uh, uh, illegal or illicit activity that they can get a hold of. Look, that's why some of the folks have come across uh, out of Libya into Europe because they've gotten into the, the refugee stream there. So right. this, is, this is not a Muslim ban. The Muslims I've spoken to here, Jesse, don't want the violent Muslims coming here to kill them right. as well. So the idea here is the president has to do things to set up mechanisms and gateways so that the good folks get through, we maintain commerce, and shut down any potential yep. of the bad guys coming here. It's very and if simple. Uh, the travel ban prevents just one bad guy from coming into the United States... It's a success. Absolutely. Guys, thank you very much. All right, remember this Antifa <laughs> protest? <it> <laughs> That's right. Pro protest leader and middle school teacher. She's a middle school teacher who got arrested for assault. Take a look. Come here now. Middle school teacher. Well, now she's being hit where it hurts. Former UC Berkeley Pre College Republican president Troy Warden is suing Yvette Falarca for $100,000 in damages. He claims she threatened him and limited his right to free speech. Well, Mark Moisier is the attorney representing Troy Warden, and he joins us now. Hey, Mark. Good morning, Mark. Hey, thank you for having me. So you're seeking $100,000 uh, worth of damages, alleging assault, harass or alleging harassment uh, on college campus, Troy is. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about some of the harassment he is facing or he has faced. Okay, well, yes. Well, Yvette Falarca actually sued uh, Troy Warden, got a civil harassment restraining order, which restricted his First Amendment rights and his Second Amendment rights, plus restricted his ability to get around the campus and made it impossible for him to do his job as Berkeley College Republican. In order to get this temporary restraining order, she had to lie to the courts and, you know, said that Troy said things that we had video evidence of their encounters, which he never th said. And she uh, alleged events that occurred at certain times and dates. And the school uh, showed that uh, Troy was at work during those times. So she lied to the courts, got this temporary restraining order, the purpose of which was to so that she could have her meetings to disrupt mm -hmm. the Ben Shapiro event that was going on in August. And uh, we are now counter suing her back for uh, damages. And we're suing 
her attorneys for sanctions for, for bringing this frivolous action. So, uh, Mark, we've seen, we've been showing videos of Yvette. We also showed the video of her punching a protester. That was not your client, Troy Warden. But we will note that uh, Yvette is the leader of a group called By Any Means Necessary, an Antifa or, or anti-fascist group, as she says. Well, by any means necessary, according to her, means punching people at events if necessary. Uh, what, what, where, do you, where do you believe this will go? Uh, ultimately, your, your client is, is suing because uh, he doesn't want to be assaulted, wants the ability to have free speech as a college Republican at Berkeley. Uh, what, what's your hope, hopeful outcome on this? Well, you know, as you said earlier, hit them where it hurts in their pocketbooks. And, you know, we're not just going after her, we're going against her attorneys because her attorneys are actually, you know, Shanta Driver is one of the national leaders for the organization by any means necessary. So we're uh, going against the organization. This was a clear plot by the organization by any means necessary to restrict the Berkeley College Republicans because they did not like the speech that they were given. Yvette Florica has said uh, that she thinks it's self-defense to beat up somebody who she calls a fascist, and she is calling the Berkeley College Republicans fascists. So by implication, she thinks it's okay to beat up college Republicans. Uh, this all ar arose from a meeting that she was having where she was planning on disrupting the Ben Shapiro event. Mm -hmm. And when the Berkeley College Republicans showed up to try to discuss it with her, they tried to use force to keep the Berkeley College Republicans from attending their meeting where they intended to disrupt the event. Yeah. And, and and Go Mark, ahead. I, I want to get your reaction from a statement from her attorney to the East Bay Times. Uh, in quote, this motion is this motion is his attempt to use the courts to continue stalking, uh, to continue stalking Miss Florica. The First Amendment does not give Warden the right to stalk people or to violate restraining order and be in Florica's face and take video of her for 30 minutes, which Warden did after the court commanded him to stay away. So your response to that? Well, I, it's transference. They're they're basically blaming uh, Troy Warden for what for the act actions that they themselves are doing. Uh, the allegation that he violated a uh, restraining order actually came out in court that she basically served him when he was you know she obtained a temporary restraining order, waited till he was like within twenty feet of her, and then then had one of her friends serve it. You know, based upon the interaction between the team, he just, mm -hmm. it was like paper thrown at him. He said, well, let's call the police over here. And it took the police about a half hour to come over. Uh, and when the police came over and said, yes, this is, you know, called it in. Yes, this is a uh, temporary restraining order. He left. But it, it's a complete fabrication or, mis, you know, misinterpretation of the sure. truth, which is their tactic, the Scalinci tactics, you know, just don't, uh, you know, lie, cheat, tell a lie loud enough, long enough, hopefully people will believe it. Sure. I mean, when you have a group called By Any Means Necessary and then you use violent means, why are you going to be surprised if you're held to account for it? Uh, Mark Muser, attorney representing Troy Warden, thanks for being thanks, on the Mark. program this morning. Thank you.